right. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Financial Wellness Wednesday. We are so happy to have you with us um, and to uh, spend this time with us today. We're going to have a wonderful session today. Uh, our session is titled, as you know, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Or who wants to be a better, who wants to have a better understanding of their financial stuff and to work on reducing financially related stress? Well, uh, that's us, all of us. So we're so excited to welcome uh, David Sitzer with us today. He's the Vice President and Chief Investment Officer for Fi First Financial Federal Credit Union. Uh, so proud to be working with him and so happy to share his gifts and talents with all of you. So having said that, again, welcome to our session and Take it away, David. Thank you for the intro, John. Um, and more importantly, thank you all for participating. Uh, we want to make sure that you know we want to do our best for you and that you're the reason why we come to work and, and, and uh, we look forward to interacting with you. So this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, the overall concept of the presentation is that, uh, or what brings us to mind is that too many choices can be overwhelming and it's kind of like a cereal aisle in a huge grocery store. Not knowing what's available and what the words mean that are used to describe the options can make uh, selecting the proper products and making the best choices much more difficult. So we hope the presentation will explain a few of these things that are confusing and some of the terms and make your options a bit clearer to you. Uh, and, and in the end, point you in the right direction. Please understand that no matter where you are, you will make progress and that there will also be setbacks along the way. And that's all part of the process. So uh, with that said, we're going to dive in. Um, as we dive in, the first thing that I need to tell you or share with you is, um, is, a, is a bit of a disclaimer. And the, the point about the disclaimer is that what we are going to talk about today are just explanations and definitions. Uh, they're not suggestions or explicit directions for you to do something in any of these realms. If you do decide to go ahead and do something, then um, I would strongly encourage you to talk to a professional in that area an investment advisor, an insurance agent, uh, someone who, who's appropriate for that particular topic. We're just going to be very general today. Furthermore, everything that I discuss with you today is my opinions and my observations, and it's not uh, uh, directly tied or uh, inferred to be tied to my employer, First Financial. All right, well, with that said, uh, let's begin. Um, the agenda today, as you see in front of you on the screen, is to to talk about uh, your financial goals, or generally, I don't know what your financial goals are, but we've selected a few that uh, are emblematic of what I think most people are going to be dealing with throughout the course of their financial lifetime. Um, we want to make sure we save some time for questions at breakpoints. And uh, so the topics that we're going to address are uh, financial goals, as I said, saving opportunities, discussing the different types of savings accounts that there are, some debt strategies on how to reduce your overall debt burden or pay it down a little faster, reduce your interest expense, some very, very basic concepts around investing. Uh, again, sticking to the idea of just terminology uh, and account types, not delving in and giving you stock recommendations. And lastly, some considerations that apply to all of these different aspects, uh, which are generally taxes, expenses, and inflation. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, I just have listed here randomly some of the uh, financial goals that have run across in, in, in my lives and the lives of those around me. So um, hopefully that there's something here that, that would uh, be of interest to you or maybe something that creates anxiety for you. And that's, uh, that's, that's why we kind of highlighted those. So we're going to focus on these. Um, and the idea also in the, co in the conversation we're going to be having is a way maybe to free, free up a few dollars and what to do with those few extra dollars. And uh, we're going to go ahead and clarify some, some more confusion around banking and retirement account types. Overall, we just want you to become better informed. Um, and at the end, there'll be a few resources to help you uh, move forward. Next slide, please. Let's get on the same page first by defining terms. And we're gonna go to the one, the next page here is um, an important concept to have, the fiduciary standard versus the suitability standard. Uh, it, it sounds daunting. I really wanna get this point across to all of you uh, from the get-go. Um, a fiduciary is required under law to do the best that is at all possible for you. Their obligation is to put you first. A non-fiduciary or suitability standard 
also is supposed to do the best they can for you, but they're not obligated to do the absolute best. They have um, a lower uh, threshold to meet. So uh, they have to find products and services that are suitable for you, given your situation. And there can be a pretty broad spread on that. And also they, they can make those decisions based on other factors that are not necessarily completely um, yours. So it's okay to ask the people that you're working with, are you acting, acting as a fiduciary or a non-fiduciary? And what standard? Is it a suitability standard or a fiduciary standard? That said, you should know that banks and credit unions operate under the fiduciary standard for you. Um, whereas uh, a broker dealer, uh, stockbroker may or may not be. That gives you kind of a, a, an example of, of how that, that works. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit of a explanation between uh, what we're dealing with here because the terms are somewhat used interchangeably and I thought it was important to define those. So a credit union versus a bank. Um, in the case of credit unions, they're actually owned by the members. The people that put money on deposit at a credit union are considered shareholders or they're members and they get a distribution of the credit union's profitability in the form of, of higher interest rates on their deposits and lower interest rates on their borrowings, their home mortgages and auto loans. And uh, additionally, there's, um, uh, generally speaking, there's a lower fee structure. Even amongst credit unions, however, that can vary. Some credit unions like ours uh, work for a much lower fee structure, and that's a part of our culture. Uh, there are qualifications for membership. Uh, you have to be a member of a, of a particular group. In uh, our case, the credit unions, the predominant groups are uh, school t uh, people affiliated with Baltimore County and Carroll County Schools, but we have many, many others, we call them SEG groups, that are united by um, a common payroll or some other common bond that allows them to be our members. Um, and they're non-for-profit. So when we do have a, a profit, and we do have profits, we distribute them, as I said, through the way of either higher interest rates on deposits, um, lower rates on loans, and we also do make distributions uh, to um, our members in, a, in, in various bonuses. Additionally, we give an awful lot back through our scholarship program, hundreds of thousands of dollars, as well as other charitable organizations such as the Boys and Girls Club of Carroll County and uh, Carroll County Community College. So we're very embedded in our community. Now, that's not to say that banks don't do the same. Um, they are, however, for profit. And so their additional revenue uh, goes back to the shareholders. And those could be a depositor or a borrower, but generally they're not. Um, so they are working with a profit motive and driving their pricing decisions for deposits and their pricing decisions for their lending. Um, the, anyone's eligible to open up an account at, um, at a bank, and uh, they generally have a higher fee structure. Uh, one of the advantages that we've seen in banks, of course, is they tend to be, uh, have more convenience from the standpoint of branches and ATMs the, for the larger, uh, larger banks. And that would be the difference between banks and credit unions. So moving on to savings options. Um, one of the things that we have seen is that, you know, there are, uh, on the next slide, there are um, strategies on how to manage your income, where to put the money when it comes in. And I have to say, this is just a recommendation. I have difficulty meeting this actual threshold, uh, and I think most people do. Uh, one of the things that, um, that uh, the financial professionals recommend is having set aside six months of, of living expenses which is, is brutally difficult to do. I, I, I don't know that I've ever accomplished that, but the current situation we're in shows why that can be very important to have some very liquid uh, cash available and liquid resources. In case on, you know, the unfortunate happens, like where we are now, and you're looking for a job for an extended period of time because of something well beyond your control. Uh, the, emer the idea of an emergency fund is just to cover your short-term expenses like a dryer going up or, um, some other unexpected expense so that you don't have to borrow. That's kind of the purpose of this is to try to avoid having you reach for a credit card or borrow money from your retirement account or something like that. Um, and we want you to work towards setting up the, these different accounts that you don't touch. Perhaps they're not even uh, available for you to easily access the money unless it's an emergency, kind of a break the glass and emergency kind of standpoint. And one way to do that, and the credit union here can help you with that, is to set up automatic transfers out of your checking account into a, a secondary or tertiary savings account that you can also set up here at the credit union or elsewhere that uh, sets aside money on a regular basis. You don't even see it going out, $20, $50, whatever it is, 
a paycheck or a month or what have you, so that if there is a problem, you know where to go to get that money. So with that said, we can move on to the next slide. This is where I wanted to focus in on the confusing terms and what the role is for these various accounts that are considered banking or credit union type of accounts. Um, one you're probably very familiar with is a savings account. And those in normal times, not current times when interest rates are so very, very low, they generally pay a higher interest rate than your other accounts that are available to you. They are limited withdrawals. And that's why they, the credit union can pay you extra on that is because we know the money's going to be there for us to lend to other people, or if we, have, uh, if we are investing it, that we can have that cash. You're not going to pull it all out at once. And historically, they've been limited to six withdrawals per month. However, because of the pandemic, there's been a, um, a waiver of that requirement. So there's cur not currently any limits on the withdrawals you can make out of your savings account. The savings accounts are often tiered. Uh, so the more that you put on deposit, the higher the interest rate. And for each one of those tiers, that is a minimum balance threshold you'd have to meet. So $1,000 might be one tier, 5,000 might be another tier. Credit, uh, savings accounts uh, generally have low or no fees. Um, on the transactional side, so the savings account is what you're setting aside non-transactionally. You're setting that aside for the goals that we just discussed in the previous slides. A checking account, that's for quick withdrawals, that's for writing checks, that's for your debit card, that's what's used for everyday purchases. Generally speaking, you don't have much of a balance in your checking account, just enough, enough to cover whatever your transactions are going to be. Um, and also, of course, mobile payments come out of that. Again, this being unusual times, uh, the checking accounts, and our checking account is a great example of that, actually do pay a much higher interest rate. And we do pay rewards on uh, debit card use in that. So there's an opportunity there, which is unusual, to actually produce a little bit of um, income or income, but to get a little more money out of your checking account. So I would recommend that you look into that wherever you do your banking or credit union. union. Um, checking accounts at banks and some credit unions also have fees, which um, you wouldn't see on the savings account. So there could be fees for checks. There could be fees for foreign ATM use. So you have to keep an eye out for that. Switching back to the savings discussion side of the conversation for a second, with the idea that limited access to your funds, um, you're rewarded, and I have to always put that caveat in normal times, these not being normal times, with higher interest rates, the more that the, the funds are restricted. So there's a product called a certificate of deposit, and they're available for various terms. Uh, one month, three months, six months, five months, um, I'm sorry, a year, two years, five years, things like that. The longer the money's tied up with the credit union, you'll get on that. So that might be an opportunity for you to set money aside for something that you, you, you don't need in the short term or your emergency fund. And if you break it, there is a penalty, but they're usually not um, that onerous. They could be, and I'm not encouraging you to do that on a regular basis. I'm saying that you don't have to be afraid that if you set that money aside for emergency and then you need it, that you're going to lose an awful lot of money when you break it and pull it out early. Uh, on the transaction side, lastly, I want to talk about cash balance and prepaid cash cards. You're probably familiar with those uh, Starbucks or uh, Target gift cards and all those. Many of those are reloadable. Um, they are, in a lot of cases, just as really accepted as a Visa or MasterCard. And they're, um, they're very convenient. The, um, the problem with those is you don't get any interest on them. Uh, sometimes, as I said, they are reloadable. Sometimes they're not. Uh, a lot of times they have fees and the risk is that if you lose the card, although they're getting much better at this, if you lose the card, you've lost that money. So it's more like cash than, than anything else. A credit card, if you lose that, you cancel the card and you're not liable for um, the expenses on that. The last thing to discuss is um, a certain type of accounts that you can open at a credit union or a bank that, um, that allow you to set money aside before you pay taxes on them or that you can deduct the contributions off of your taxes. And that has the advantage of reducing your total tax liability, which can be a great saving strategy. The higher your tax rate, the greater the savings. Um, so the flexible spending account and the HSA, the health savings account, are the two that I'll talk about first. Um, you put the money in, it comes out of your paycheck. An FSA is generally, an HSA is generally run by your employer, but it doesn't have to be. You can set them up, as I said, at a credit union. And what happens is um, you're not paying taxes on the money that comes out. 
and it goes into the account, you were going to use it anyway. So in the case of a flexible spending account for childcare, you put a few thousand dollars in there, that's saving you 15, 20%, uh, whatever your tax rate is on that. And then when you have a childcare expense, you pay it out of that or a transportation expense um, or a healthcare expense, you pay it out of that. One of the major differences between an FSA and an HSA is that at the end of the year, if you haven't used all your money in your FSA, you lose it. And that's a real bad um, situation to be in. And unfortunately, right now, again, because of the pandemic, um, you know, if your childcare has closed, you're not able to spend that FSA money. So what will happen is you, the government is working, Congress is, has a bill in front of them where they're evaluating a way to extend the use of the FSA funds into the following year and they won't be surrendered. The HSA doesn't have that restriction. Um, in fact, the HSA is a lot more flexible and it allows you to uh, even invest that money in a, in a mutual fund at some point. You can transfer to a brokerage firm and invest in a mutual fund. An IRA, you can open up at a bank or a credit union as well. The choices there are going to be limited to savings products or CDs as we've discussed. And the IRA also functions as a pre-tax withdrawal. So if you were to put $5,000 in it and you know, you're in the 10% tax bracket, theoretically that saves you $500 on your taxes. Uh, there's a double asterisk there because um, in recent years, the, um, there's been an, a way to set aside that money after you pay taxes on it for your retirement. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit more as we go on, that has a different kind of advantage. So on to the, um, the next slide is um, debt strategies. But before we move into that, I, I think it's a good opportunity, Joan, if we have a, any questions, we have a minute or two, is there? Absolutely, any? And, and I apologize, um, guests, that if you have questions, there's a, a chat feature <clears throat> on the bottom of your screen, click that and you'll have a window that'll pop up on your right-hand side. Um, that will give you opportunity to type your question in and then I'll share that with David. So we do have a question, David. Sure. Um, are HSA withdraw withdrawals always tax-free? Well, from the standpoint, again, I would really strongly encourage, and that's a disclaimer I'm going to say throughout you to talk to your tax accountant about that. But the idea that, um, that you're using it for the appropriate um, medical expense, then sure. But uh, if you were to be audited, you just want to make sure you're using it for the right expenses. And we have another good question. Uh, can those of us receiving Social Security and Medicare, are we able to contribute to an, H an HSA? You know, I apologize. That is going to be out of my realm. If you, I will get you a definitive answer for that. Um, I'm, I don't believe so, but um, I'm, if you leave your email address, I'll make sure I get you a, an appropriate answer from a professional for that. I'm just going to make myself a quick note. See, as I said, we're, we're talking about very general, predominantly banking strategies here. Um, uh, and I apologize for not anticipating that one. But I and I'm get, happy to get that participant's information as well and, and gather that for you. I'll get you an answer before the day is over. Absolutely. And so, great. So it looks like that's where we are with the questions right now. But uh, keep putting in those questions as we're going along. And we'll, we'll come to another part where we'll pause and, and uh, ask David those questions. All right. So... Um, up until this point, we've been talking about what I like to think of as the asset side of your personal balance sheet, your savings, um, and you know the money you have. So that's an important concept. Now we're going to move to the liability side of your balance sheet, um, money you owe people. So with that said, we'll go on to the, the next um, the next slide. So in a nutshell, there's basically two types of debt, at least from the lender's perspective. Um, that's collateralized meaning that there's an, a hard asset behind it, such as a home or an auto. And because it's collateralized, the, um, the, the lender has the ability theoretically to come back and, um, and take that asset from you if unfortunately there was some reason for that, uh, um, for that, present, for, for that, uh, for that to happen. If there was a problem, they would come back and, and they would, they would uh, take that asset from you. And, and given, given that situation, uh, the lender, in, in our case, us, is willing to offer you a much, lower, um, a much lower interest rate because it's secured by collateral. So th that's also the case with cars, too. You see that with uh, cars, they're often at a, at a much lower interest rate. Unsecured, which is a credit card because there's nothing to take if you default, um, they're at a much higher rate. And they, they, I think the federal law is now up to 
24 or 28% uh, for some store credit cards. And that can be pretty, pretty high rate because, um, and that's also dependent, not just on the quality of the collateral, by the way, but also on your credit quality that determines um, the interest rate that's charged. So a 10 year mortgage is going to be at a lower rate than a 30 year mortgage, a five year or two year auto loan should be at a lower rate than a seven year uh, auto loan. Student loans fall into a special category because they, um, they are a personal unsecured loan. However, they, many of them are government guaranteed. So the lender is both subsidized and so, is sometimes subsidized by the government. So they're paid a little bit of money, which reduces the interest rate that you as the student loan borrower would experience. But also the government is going to uh, guarantee that the, the lender will get paid. So those come in at a much more favorable rate. And those are the kinds of loans that we're going to be talking about today, those what you see in front of you. Of course, there's many other types of, of ways of getting into debt, but um, those are the ones that we're going to focus in on today. The next slide talks a little bit um, more in depth uh, because what we've done here is we've got an actual example of um, somebody's indebtedness. And uh, this is a presentation I've been using for a while. So the interest rates don't necessarily reflect where you would get, um, get funded or get borrow money today, but it's not that unusual. So an auto loan right now would probably be pretty close to 2%, um, but that, so, that, so the higher interest rate here does skew the, the advantage, but the concept still remains pure and is one I want you to, to, try, to um, try to grab onto. So a $20,000 auto loan for five years at 8%, a mortgage 200,000 at 4.5%, it wasn't but a year or two ago that 30-year loans were 4.5%. Um, a student loan, um, I'm unfortunately familiar with those, 5% uh, for 10 years is, is pretty good. There are some that are higher and a few that are lower, but that's, that's about where they are. And a credit card at 15%, that's pretty good. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the store credit cards are 24%. Uh, and some are much lower, but for the most part, um, that's, that's a reasonable snapshot of where to begin. So the concept is how do you, the, the, what we want to discuss is how do you pay, how do you reduce the amount of overall interest you pay and how to get out of debt as quickly as possible. So whereas this example might not fit you exactly, the concept still um, is worth uh, walking through. So here it is um, in, in, a, uh, in a chart for you. Looking at the left-hand column, you can see what we just discussed. And if you make just the minimum payments on those minimum on those loans, you'd be paying 406 on your auto, 1013 on your mortgage, $159 on your um, student loan and your credit card 60. So at the end of all of those 30 years of payments, you paid $175,000 and it took you 30 years. So the idea behind this is you get $100 extra and uh, that's a regular $100 that's coming in. You're maintaining, you are maintaining your payments, the minimum payments right there. What do you do with that extra $100? Well, the first thought is why don't you just distribute it equally across all of your, four of your indebtedness. And that has an impact. It reduces your overall debt by uh, $11,000 roughly, uh, your over, overall interest rather. And it cuts about a year and a half off of your total payments. Um, another concept which would be a lot more efficient is what we're calling the snowball effect. You take that $100, all of it, and you put it on the credit card. And the credit card is the, the lowest balance. So, you pay that off as quickly as you can with that extra hundred bucks. And then you roll that into your next lowest balance loan or your next highest balance loan rather, which is your student loan. And this is irrespective of the interest rates you're paying on them. So now instead of your student loan being $159, it's 160 plus 159. So that gets paid down a lot faster. And then that snowballs over into your auto loan, the next largest one. So you've got the 160 plus the 159 um, plus the 406. So you're 319 plus 406, and that gets paid off even faster. And then the rest of it, um, the rest of the, that, that amount rolls into the 725, rolls into the plus the 1013 to pay that off faster. Now, mind you, you're still making the same dollar amount payments. You're just paying them in a certain order. So that reduces your total interest payment to 113,000, and it shaves almost 50% off of the, the loan. You, You've cut your total indebtedness years to 16, 17 rate, basically. So that really, really speeds up your payoffs. And you're not paying more than you were um, in the other scenario. You're not taking extra money. You took that extra $100 and you put it on your lowest balance and rolled it up into the others. 
Of course, this assumes that you don't also um, add to your indebtedness while you're doing this. Um, so that's a great way to save an awful lot of money. So you, your total interest is 113 instead of 174. So you're looking at roughly $60,000 in interest savings over the life of, of, of your indebtedness. Now, the last one, which is the most effective, is paying down the highest interest first. Um, so in that case, that's the avalanche method. And I, I'm not able to see that last column on my screen uh, because of the chat windows. I don't know if that's the same for everyone, it, but you can minimize it if, if you can't see it. There's a way to minimize that. So in the avalanche method, you pay off your highest interest rate first. And that's your credit card. So that 160 goes, and then, um, then you're going to the auto loan, which is the next highest loan. So it works the same initially. And then you're going to your um, student loan next, and then to your mortgage. And that saves you, um, your total interest expense is 98,000. So that's saving you, what, 100, uh, saving you $76,000 roughly. And it cuts your, your total indebtedness down to 16 and a half years. So it's the idea I'm trying to share with you today of what do you do, how do you pay off your debt more quickly? And that's a great example. Um, but you know, additionally, what do you do if you get a couple extra dollars? Where do you put it and how do you distribute it? You don't distribute it across all of them. You pay down either the lowest balance first so you can free up that cash to go somewhere else, or you go ahead and uh, pay, the, um, pay the highest interest rate first. So we're gonna have a, I'm sure that was a lot to cover there. We're gonna have a couple of uh, room for questions in, um, in a minute or two, but I'd like to move on to the next slide. So where do you get that extra $100? Um, this I'm sharing with you uh, as a strategy. Uh, I am going to give you another disclaimer at this point. This could backfire. So please be very, very cautious and make sure that you're able to do this if you in, uh, endeavor uh, to undertake this. So a lot of credit card companies or a number of credit card companies offer a zero interest rate introduction promotional rate. So assuming you have $1,000, let's say on your Southwest uh, Chase credit card, and the interest rate on that is 24%. The minimum payment, if that's the, the way you're running this, is $30 a month. And if you'll read across just that first line there, $30 a month, 20 of it goes to interest and 10 of it goes to principal. It's gonna take you a very, very long time to pay that off, and when you're done, you'll have paid the $1,000 back, but you also paid $332.19 in interest. If you take advantage of a balance transfer uh, for, let's say in this example, we're picking one year at zero, there's some that are out there for uh, six months, and there's some are out there for a year, and some of them are out, actually out there for a little bit longer. Some of them also have balance transfer fees, which also would mitigate uh, your success doing this but it's still worth investigating from a mathematics standpoint. I only picked a thousand dollars. So obviously if you have um, more balance, a larger balance, your savings would be greater. So if you were to transfer this for a year at zero, um, the interest paid goes away. So what you're left with is um, all that, that's column there, that interest paid column, you're saving yourself $226 in interest, which would go to your principal. So at the end of the 12th month, sticking with the minimum payments with the current credit card, you've got a balance that you still owe of $866. But if you do it with the balance transfer, you have $640 that you owe. So that's a way of um, speeding up your debt payment. Again, I'm gonna end this slide with the caution that if it, those zeros reset to another, uh, to reset to a market rate at the end, and that may put you back in a spot where, um, you know, you could end up with a higher interest rate on that. So you really want to be careful when you do these. Um, I would really encourage caution with that. But I wanted to make sure you're aware of it. So on the next slide, we're looking at another way to actually, and that slide was a way of reducing your interest paid. This is a way of increasing your monthly cash flow. Another disclaimer here, please. Um, so this is the idea that you would increase the deductible on your insurance products. So, and this is why I would recommend you talk to your insurance agent on this. If you are carrying a low or no deductible on your auto and home insurance, increasing your deductible will reduce your monthly or semi-annual bill with your insurance company. Let's say we knew someone that was a family of four and they had two cars and they had a $0 deductible, meaning that if they have a claim, the insurance company pays all of it. You know, a little scratch or a tree limb falling on your car, insurance company pays for that. Um, so by increasing your deductible, 
what would happen is that any claims below a, the deductible amount, you have to pay. And the insurance company figures you're going to file a claim less frequently, therefore um, you are less likely to cost them money. And so they're willing to give you a lower rate. So in the case of a family of four with two cars, the difference between a zero deductible and a thousand dollar deductible is a savings of $1,400 a year. So that's, if that's your situation, that's 11, uh, that's a, you know, your hundred dollars a month more, that's a, um, you know, $120 a month more. Um, and what I would suggest with that is if you're not putting it towards debt, that what you would do is you would put it into a CD, a certificate deposit. And as I discussed earlier, yes, there is a penalty if you were to have an accident or have a claim and need that money, but at least the money would be there and you wouldn't take a loss on the money and you wouldn't have to um, use a credit card or borrow money some other way from your retirement account or what have you to meet that need. So it's a little hard to get started, but think about how much $1,400 a year starts to uh, um, accumulate very quickly. Uh, and that's real money. Um, a single person, of course, the savings would not be as great. So I have um, uh, two scenarios here below. Again, these, this is a real person's uh, analysis. So this is what they would be saving. Um, a $500 deductible for that person was $926. A $5,000 deductible on their car was $373. Now, that is um, not as big a savings and it's not gonna compensate you. You can't take that money and set it aside for a $5,000 deductible. But what that does tell you is that perhaps your car is very old. Um, you can dispense with uh, some of the insurance products you're using on that because you, if the car was in an accident, you might not wanna fix it anyway. Um, so there's, there's that analysis. The homeowner's insurance um, was a much lower savings, but it's still something to look at and something to consider. Uh, while we were researching this particular slide, we ran across a quote that I had wanted to include was uh, from insurancequotes.com. Your savings can vary from 4% to 28%, depending on where you live. So that was an analysis when we were looking at changing your deductible. So I know that covers a lot of varied territory here. Um, moving to the next slide, we have a minute or two for, um, for uh, discussion uh, questions, if anybody has any right now. We are actually on time by my clock. Right. You're doing a great job, David, and giving us so much good information. I really I'm appreciate it. <laughs> so here's another HSA question. Uh, what can cause an audit via HSA? Or is this just in case you're selected for an audit, you would want to have the receipts to prove purchase? Okay. All right. Well, I don't have any direct experience with that either. I apologize. But I will tell you that, um, at least from my experience using my HSA, um, the products are often say HSA eligible um, on them. You know, I go to Target to get my prescriptions filled and it tells you uh, whether or not it's HSA el eligible. Um, what would cause an audit? I, the IRS, from my experience, the IRS isn't combing through um, everybody's records. You, you, don't you don't necessarily provide that documentation when you file your taxes. Again, speaking personally from my direct experience, I think the problem is that if you were unfortunately to be set, selected at random or there was some reason for you to be audited, they might look there. And so, you know, um, non-standard, I mean, buying medicine for your dog with your HSA card or, you know, buying uh, personal care products with your HSA card, uh, that would be a problem. And the penalty, um, I don't know. You'd have to check with your tax accountant for that. It, it just isn't something that I would think is, is a good idea to do. Um, I would encourage you not to abuse the HSA or FSA cards. Um, if you need more information on that, you can reach out to me and I will put you in touch with someone who will give you a, a definitive binding answer if you would like that. That's great, David. Um, I know personally I have a big manila envelope and I throw all my HSA receipts into it. <laughs> That's just kind of what I do. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have another question. Uh, suggestions you may have for paying off debt on private student loans that have an adjustable interest rate? Okay, well, um, hopefully that adjustable rate's working in your favor. Uh, interest rates are much, much, much lower. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I can tell you some of the things that I've done. I've never taken a private student loan. We've used the, um, the guaranteed loans. Uh, the avalanche effect or the avalanche approach is going to be how that, that's going to work. You want to pay down your highest interest rate as, pos as quickly as possible because the longer you delay that, the, the more you're paying back and, and that snowballs. Um, 
the um, the problem with private debt is that uh, um, you it's much more difficult to renegotiate. Um, there, there's I don't believe they have, a, for example, income uh, tied repayment plans. Um, I can, if you want to email me, I can send you some resources on student loan, private student loan um, uh, uh, strategies. But um, you know, I, I I think that that's a they're they're definitely a tough problem and and the new administration coming in is probably going to be looking at student loan um, relief. That doesn't mean they actually pass it, but the problem will be that private student loans will more than likely not be included in, in those release programs. So um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a tough one. Uh, I mean, the money has to be paid back. The fastest way to pay it back is, is to make sure you don't have uh, a, a, as long as the contracted amount in indebtedness. You could look to refinance it through a personal loan um, if you can find a better rate. But again, if it's adjustable, I'm imagining that it's tied to say prime and those rates are really low right now, and they're going to remain low for a while. Any, any other questions? So in response to the interest rate, um, our participant says that the interest rate ranges between 8 and 10%. Okay, well, 8 and 10% is higher than you'd probably get on a, a guaranteed student loan, but um, that's actually a pretty good interest rate given where unsecured loans are right now. As I mentioned, you know, credit card loans um, uh, and personal, personal loans are going to be in the, in the low teens uh, to mid teens. So I don't know that um, going out and borrowing more money, especially if you're going to extend the amount of time you're paying it back, what you're driving for is lower interest rate and you're driving for um, a shorter term because the longer the term, even at a lower rate, could end up costing you more money. So if you roll from an 8% student loan that has to be paid off in 10 years to a 7% or a 5% loan that's now 15 years, in the long run, you'll have paid more money. So um, I, you know, I, I, I can't, um, you know, I can't tell you exactly what to do, but eight to 10% is in today's market is, is not that terrible. Um, you know, I, I, we have government loans for our children that are in that, in that realm and even a bit higher, I think. That's so. great. Uh, so he, here we have another question. What is the impact on your credit when you apply for a 0% promotional rate credit card? Anytime you have a hard pull on your credit, there's impact. So that would require, if you applied for, and, and that's a great point, thank you for asking that. Um, your credit score determines your credit rate, uh, the rate, your interest rate. And if you do apply for any credit, um, that is going to be noted on your on your Fair Isaac score, your FICO score, that uh, your lenders will be looking at. So you have to be careful uh, not to go crazy on these uh, applying for for uh, credit cards. If you haven't applied for any loans in a number of years, um, you know you're going to see um, not much of a of a, a ding to your credit score. By the way, um, most credit card companies that you, uh, if you have a credit card currently, and I know we're adding this if we haven't already rolled it out. They have ability for you to go in to check your credit score um, through the credit card, and most of them offer a modeling uh, capability. So you can say, uh, what would happen if I paid this off? Or what would my credit score look like if I applied for more credit? And they can give you a rough idea of what's going on with that. And they give you a nice graphical representation of how your, um, of what the components of your current credit score are, what they look like. I have now fallen behind my schedule. Okay, well, we're, we're finished with this group of questions and I thank everybody yeah. for them. Oh, I do have, um, so just to follow up to that question, does it impact your credit in the same way regardless of whether or not you're approved for the card? Every hard pull is gonna impact your credit, so yes. I'm sorry, that's, that's one well, of the answers. Right. So, um, and, and if there are questions at the end, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to talk faster, we can have a little more time. And sure, I really and I'll put that on. I'll, we'll I'll hold those questions now and have, let you okay. get back into investing. Thank yeah, you, right David. On the, on the horse here. Okay, so the next uh, sector is investing, the next segment. Um, and I wanted to throw this out there just as an example. Uh, again, these are all hypothetical. But think about this. A 25-year-old investing $5,000 a year for 10 years into a retirement account, and they invest $55,000 at the end of that 10 years, versus a 35-year-old 
who invest $5,000 a year for 25 years or uh, until they retire, and they invest $130,000. We're assuming they retire at age 60, and we're assuming that the annual rate of return averaged out is 8%. I ask you, who do you think is going to have more money at age 60, and by how much? We're not opening this up for um, a contest, but if you'll roll to the next slide, you'll see the answer. You see if it lines up, lines up with what you're thinking. Um, the next slide shows the person that started earlier and quit or stopped at 35 comes out way ahead. And the person that started at 35, you know, that's a significant distance, uh, difference. And I'm going to point this out to you. Then we're talking about investing here and on the, we're on, back on the asset side of your balance sheet again, things that you own. But this also applies to the, um, to, the, to the liability side that we just discussed, the indebtedness. So you're way, way worse off if you, I shouldn't say that, you, um, you will lag behind if you delay paying these things down. You want to get the money uh, paid down on your debt as quickly as possible, as soon as possible. And I'm just gonna throw this out here, although it's not related to the slide, so if you just bought a house or, um, for example, and um, you know, it's the first year or two you own it and you were to throw a bunch of, uh, a chunk of money on your mortgage in the first few years, that makes a massive difference than if you were to put that amount of money onto your mortgage later because you've reduced the amount that you're paying interest on. So please keep that concept in, um, in mind when we're talking about either paying off debt or investing. Um, you want what's called compounding uh, to work in your favor. You, the earlier you get that ball rolling, the bigger it is at the end. So hopefully you guys all uh, came to the same conclusion I did or that the analysis does. You're better off getting started. And even if you stop, you are come out way ahead. Um, but of course, you, could, you would hopefully continue on investing for more. Um, the next slide, please. All right, so this is similar to what we discussed when we were talking about banking and credit union type of accounts. This is under the, um, the umbrella of investment accounts. And I find this is confusing for a lot of people that I talk to. They would, would say that they're buying a 401k or they're buying an IRA, but those are not things that you actually purchase. You open them up like you would a savings or a checking account. And within those types of accounts, that's where you're, you buy uh, your investments. That's where your investments go. So um, 401k, which is you'd open up through your employer, the 401k is just a, the name, it just comes from the, the tax line item where it, it, was, it was written. It's, it, it doesn't really mean anything. But it's an employer-sponsored uh, program. And in a lot of cases, uh, the employer actually contributes on your, beh on your behalf. They, they put money in your account for you. Um, there are, referring back to our discussion earlier about the IRA account, these, the money for your 401k generally comes out pre-tax, meaning if you put a it, you're not paying taxes on $1,000. Um, so I'm sorry, you saved yourself $1,000. Um, so that is um, a way for you to set money aside for your retirement. And, um, and it's kind of a gift because in many cases, your employer will actually give you money as you participate. Now, in recent years, they have amended uh, or added to the 401k the ability to contribute your after-tax money instead. And um, if you contribute after-tax money, you've already paid taxes on the, on the money that you put to work in the account. Therefore, you don't ever pay taxes on it again. And that's a tremendous advantage, especially if you're younger or uh, you have a lot of years ahead of you for that to grow. Um, the IRA is the, the uh, we discussed that before, so I won't belabor this, but it's the, uh, the personal counterpart to the 401k, uh, which is employer sponsored. So if your employer doesn't have a 401k, you can open up an IRA with a brokerage firm and you can do that also pre or post tax. It's a tax advantaged account um, or not tax advantaged. Uh, you, have, um, you have to have taxable income, which takes me back to the HSA question about Medicare and Medicaid. Um, or in Social Security, I think that you have to have taxable income, and I, as I promised earlier, I will get that answer directly to you, um, in order to contribute to your um, IRA and your FSA, HSA. Um, so there, the, 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 um, the two different types of accounts accomplish roughly the same thing. Uh, the Roth IRA, I wanted to break out down here for you the difference between the 
the, uh, the taxation view of these different accounts. So the Roth, you pay tax, uh, taxes on your contribution now. So you put your 10,000 in, you have to pay that tax on it when it goes in. You have to have the account for five years and be 59 and a half or older to make any withdrawals. Um, there's no required minimum distribution. And that's really helpful because if you are still working or you don't need the money, you don't want to be selling your investments out of that account and taking the distributions if you don't have to. Uh, there, the current limitations, under 50, you can put 6,000 a year in there. Um, over 50, it's, it's 7,000. And um, this is non-qualified money, meaning that it's, it's um, the tax uh, status, it's already been taxed. Um, under the traditional IRA, you uh, pay taxes on the contributions when you pull them out. So going back to our illustration, if you put 10 grand in there that you didn't pay taxes on and it grows to 100 when you retire, you're paying taxes on that money when it comes out. Hopefully, you'll be in a much lower tax bracket than you were as an income earner, and that's the reason for it. You have to be 70 or and a half um, during the tax year of the contribution or younger. Um, under 50, it's the same uh, restrictions for contributions. Um, and that's qualified money, meaning that it's going to be taxed when you pull it out, um, or it went in non taxable, either non-taxed. So um, that's the different types of accounts you would find. What's not listed here is, because um, I'm focusing on retirement, is a traditional brokerage account. And that's a, similar to these um, from the standpoint that it's at a broker, broker dealer or a firm or a mutual fund company. And that is a taxable account. And you would buy your investments in these various accounts, including your regular brokerage account. Um, so going to the types of investments that go into your account is on the next slide. The traditional types of things that will go into these accounts, your IRA, your, um, well, before I continue, your 401k is generally limited choices. So I'm gonna address that in a moment. But in your IRA account or your regular brokerage account, you can buy stocks, bonds, professionally managed investments, such as uh, um, mutual funds or ETFs and annuities. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in, in the next slide. So if you go to the next slide, um, the stock is, uh, an in, you should think of a stock as direct ownership in a company. So um, in this case, the example I found, I was throw it in there, it's no longer available, but at one point the Baltimore Orioles were a publicly traded company, meaning you can buy an investment in them. And you would be earning, whenever you buy stock in a company, it gives you the ability to earn income on a percentage basis of your position in the company. So if it's a million dollar company and you have $100,000 of their stock, you would get 10% of the income that that company gets. So um, obviously smaller amounts you could buy very, and now you can buy some very small shares, percentage of shares. But the idea is you're actually an owner of that company and therefore you get the benefits of their income. They don't make money, you don't get any money. Um, and the valuation of those stocks goes up and down over time, and there's a lot of risk in owning individual stocks. So you may pick a company that goes out of business, um, and that would be horrible, um, or you may pick a company that does really well. So you have to have some market-based and analytical knowledge, and that's why you should go to a professional if you're going to be buying and selling stocks. Um, the companies sell stocks so that they can get capital that they need to expand their business to buy other companies or to expand uh, into other areas. Um, one other thing about a, a, a common stock is it gives you the ability to, to vote. You can actually show up at the annual meetings and voice your opinion to the chairman of the board and the board of directors and, and management and tell them you like or don't like what they're doing. Um, there's another class of stock, which I'm not gonna go into, but I'll be happy to address it later. Um, it's called preferred stock. It doesn't give you voting rights. It tends to have less price volatility um, and it has a kind of a better uh, position should that company go out of business for you getting your money back. The next slide talks about um, my, my area of focus with the credit union, and those are called bonds. And um, so from the perspective of um, an investor in bonds, people tend to think of bonds as being very stable and safe versus stocks. And I would throw my own disclaimer on this one. Uh, bonds can be just as volatile as stocks. Uh, you do, well, the way a bond works is it's a, it's a loan. It's, it's essentially a loan. So if you think about the loans that you have with um, and how they work, if you have a mortgage or an auto loan, you borrowed all that money in a lump sum. And in the case of an auto or a mortgage, you're paying um, interest on that every month. 
and you're also paying back some of your principal. But there are other kinds of loans and bonds tend to fall more into that category where you buy a whole chunk of the company borrows a whole chunk of money. So you're not an owner of that company. You're, you are um, a lender to that company. And the company will pay you on a regular basis, monthly, semi-annually or annually, uh, interest for the money that, that you borrowed or that they borrowed from you. And that tends to be, um, those payments are, are fixed and agreed upon before you, um, you know, when, when you get the investment and the principal amount is understood. And so those are often referred to as fixed income investments. And there's a lot of different people that, um, that can issue bonds, a lot of different corporations. And we're going to talk about that on the, the next slide. Uh, so starting with the biggest circle there, the U.S. government is the single largest issuer of debt or borrower in the market, and they tend to be the um, they tend to be the ones that are uh, the highest credit quality. They don't tend to be; they are the highest credit quality. So they're rated, uh, ironically, AAA, AA, but that's another story. Um, so they they are the most liquid and and highly rated and traded uh, investments in the bond world. Um, I've been. We're running a little short on time, so I'm gonna breeze through this here a little bit. We'll talk about it more if you'd like. Um, the other issuers of bonds are corporations, which we just, if you'll roll back one second on that one. Um, so co corporations can issue bonds. So companies like, you know, Verizon, McDonald's, what have you. Also municipalities such as the state of Maryland, Baltimore County, Howard County, uh, um, Maryland Health and Higher Ed, they also issue bonds. And if you live in that area, you don't pay taxes on that income. And that was important point I wanted to make on the interest that you get. And finally, there's agency bonds, which are kind of a hybrid between a corporation and a government, and they tend to carry the government uh, backing, although they're not explicitly backed by the government. So they tend to be higher rated, but lower interest. So please go to the next slide. Um, professionally managed investments, and for time's sake, we're just going to focus on the top two here. Um, a mutual fund is a, uh, a company, like any other company, and their mission or their job is rather than making pizzas or selling or, or making trucks and selling those is to buy and sell stocks and bonds that belong to other companies. And they create a pool of these, um, these assets, these stocks and bonds, and then they offer shares in their company to investors. And the investors at the end of every day can uh, liquidate or add to their position and so you're paying for someone to professionally manage um, the company, th those assets, and, um, and, and they're making the decisions for you. You have to pay a fee for that, which is embedded in your returns or reduces your returns. And uh, there's also a marketing fee that's in, embedded in that. In, in later years, there's a new type of an asset that's come to the market. It's called an exchange-traded fund. And for brevity, we're just going to say it's a mutual fund that doesn't have an active manager. So there's no management fee or very minimal management fee, and there's no marketing fee. And you can trade those all day long. They trade on the stock market just like stocks. I will address the other two really quickly. A real estate investment trust is a company that does what the other companies do, except instead of buying and selling stocks and bonds, they buy and sell commercial real estate. And a hedge fund is a, um, an unregulated, poor, uh, minimally regulated, uh, pool of investments that's run by professional managers as well. They're not generally available to, um, to us regular folk. Next slide, please. Um, we're going to skip this over. Uh, I'll, I'll just say an annuity is a mutual fund that has an insurance component to it that helps you um, manage the risk of the price of that going down. And it also has an added advantage for some retirement strategies. And it can pay you at some point, you can annuitize and it can pay you a stream of income. Next slide, please. Okay, so I did want to make sure I got to this. Um, let's talk about, about, the, about some of the things that are going to slow you down from getting to your goals. That's going to be taxes. Um, and we've discussed that at length already. So you have to evaluate if you have a long time horizon, maybe you want to pay your taxes now on the investments. Um, or if you don't have such a long time horizon and you're going to be at a lower tax rate, maybe you'll pay your taxes afterwards. Um, Expenses, I just discussed those on the mutual funds. There's uh, fees embedded in, in, um, in those funds uh, that we, we just covered. And sometimes on the CDs and in some of the other things like annuities, there's something called an early withdrawal penalty. I, I do want to give you this impact statement. An example of, of fees on your return, if you invested $10,000 at 6% for 10 years, 
that would grow to $43,000. A 1% fee from the manager on that would reduce your growth to only 34,000. So you've given up 7,000, oh, I'm sorry, you've given up $9,000 in, um, in income, in, in assets, because of a, what looks like a low fee of 1%. So you wanna please bear that thought in mind. Next slide. The stock market goes up and down over time. And the idea here I wanted you to take away with is if, you ha if you're forced to sell because you put too much money um, away that you can't access and you're forced to sell when the market's down, you're gonna get hurt. But I want you to understand that if you're in it, um, you know, and you wanna be in it for the long haul and there are ups and downs. This past year, we've seen about a 30% growth in this, the S&P. So uh, being a participant in the market definitely uh, will serve you if you can get in it and stick in it. Um, and that's given even despite, you can see at this chart, there's been some very, very bad times in the market, but hanging in there really makes a difference. And then um, the last slide I wanna run past you is the inflation slide. Um, if you tend to be a consumer, um, you know, you feel the pain of inflation. So you would have bought a Snickers yesterday for a dollar and it was huge. You know, nowadays you go to buy the same candy bar and it's much smaller and it costs you 50% uh, more. And you're upset because the price of things has gone up. But it doesn't, it's not always bad. And you think of yourself as an asset holder, a homeowner, or someone who owns stocks. You bought a house for 250000 At some point tomorrow, it's going to be worth 300000 And that gives you a lot more flexibility on what to do. And I want you to think about both those slides I just shared with you from who benefits on that and who doesn't. So the very last slide is how to get started. Um, and our team here at the credit union can help you with these, um, but I do wanna quit. And according to my uh, clock, there's two minutes left. So I apologize, I didn't speak faster, um, but there you have it. So I see there's 15 questions. Um, <laughs> We're good, David. Uh, I wanna share two things. Uh, before I pass these questions on to you. First of all, I want to thank you, David, for this uh, information. This is incredible information, very valuable, and I think you speak to uh, who we are at First Financial. We're here to help you. We're here to do the very best job that we can for members, and having you be one of the leaders of that team, I think uh, I, we certainly appreciate, I appreciate, and uh, I thank you for your time. I'm going to be respectful of folks who are attending this time. I want to share two things with you, but then we will excuse me, give those questions to David. So if you want to hang on, please do. The first thing is, uh, again, thank you for attending. You're going to be receiving this afternoon an email from us. And that email is going to have a survey in it because we really want to make sure that we're meeting your needs with uh, these presentations. Uh, to sort of sweeten the pot a little bit, if you return that, complete that survey and return it, we're going to put you in a raffle for a drawing for an Amazon card. So hopefully when you get that email, you'll take uh, a couple minutes and it, it's only 10 questions um, and help us out in that way. The second thing is I want to share with you an upcoming event on January 13th. This is something, um, again, that is so important to what's happening in the world right now. We're going to have our Wednesday first, uh, our Wellness First Wednesday presentation, and it's titled How to Help Children Succeed in the Digital Environment. We have professionals coming on to take your questions, to answer some questions about that. Um, and it's at 6.30. Again, register through Eventbrite. There's a link on our website. It's totally free. Share that information with your friends and colleagues because uh, I know there are lots of people in my life trying to juggle that with students at home, and it's tough. So we're here to help with that. Having said all that, uh, I'm going to go back now to your um, – we can put this resource um, information in the chat as well. Also, if you feel like you would like information, I'm going to ask you – especially for our participant who just has their telephone down there, put your, um, put your email address in the, in the chat privately to me. My name is Joan Pugh, and I will get that over to David to get that information to you, and then you won't have to share your email address with everybody. So here are the questions we have, um, David. The first is, has the law changed so that you don't have to withdraw from your IRS until age 72 or 72 and a half? Um, well, that's a tax question. I'm going to back up with a, an email to you. Um, but I, I don't, I, I don't believe that that the law has changed. I think you still have to take mandatory distributions from your. I, I assume you're talking about your IRA, as I mentioned in in the guidelines above. At, um, you have to start taking distributions. I do think, um, I, I I know that for this year, some of the mandatory distributions were waived if you didn't. I uh, need to take them uh, 
you were given an exemption on some of them. But I, I will get you uh, the tax reference that you need to answer that question. Great, thank you so much. Uh, another question, this is an interesting one to me. Um, I mean, they all are interesting, but this, I, I would really like to know the answer to this. Can you still buy savings bonds? Are they worth it? Okay, well, that's a two-part question. Um, you, the Treasury Direct program is where you would go to buy them, and that's at the Federal Reserve. I can send, I'll send you that link as well. It used to be in the old days you could go to a bank or credit union, and perhaps even the post office, and purchase them. But uh, the, the program has been um, pulled back quite a bit. And uh, it, is it still worth it? I have a philosophy that if you can set money aside for somewhere that you're not able to touch, even if the returns are not astronomical, um, it's still worth doing something like that. Um, I know that in some of my previous jobs, we've dealt with people that have had massive amounts of, of treasury uh, savings bonds, and you know they were happy to have the money. So I would say that, sure, um, if it's a larger dollar amount you're gonna to put to work, there's other types of treasury bonds you could buy um, without fees and without commission directly from the treasury. You could buy treasury notes and bills directly from the treasury. Interest rates are very, very low right now. So that might not be the best use for your money, depending on what the purpose is. And so you need to have that conversation. But yes, you can still get seven savings bonds. Great. And the other uh, question that we had was, is this presentation going to be available? And I can answer that question. So we do take these presentations and we do put them on our YouTube channel. So if you would search us, for, uh, FFFCU of Maryland, on YouTube, um, we need to process it, but uh, give us a couple of weeks and it will be there for you. That YouTube uh, channel is also a great place to look at past presentations if you missed something and, it, and it'll be available. Did anybody else have any other questions? You guys have been so great. And, and, and I wanna reiterate, I'm available uh, as the credit union is as a resource for everyone. And Joan's gonna make sure that you have a way to get in touch with me if you have any other questions that come up or that you didn't wanna put into the chat. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Well, thank you. And thank you, David. And thank you for participants. Hopefully, we'll see you on the 13th. Keep track. We, have, uh, we also have some upcoming uh, events that might be of interest. One is about auto purchasing and financing. That's going to be coming up next month. And then in March, we're going to be talking with one of our mortgage uh, professionals here at First Financial sharing those resources with you. So again, have a great afternoon. Go ahead and just uh, click leave and we hope you are well and safe and happy. Thank you very much.